So uh, Jeffrey is going to take us through the usefulness of science fiction beyond Star Wars conventions and trivial pursuit knowledge. Yes, it's, it's far more worthwhile than just those things. So um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Kolominski. And like Kim said, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, why I think science fiction is useful. Uh, but before I get into my talk in full, I thought it'd be a good idea just to actually define what science fiction is. Um, let you guys know what my views are of it, uh, and then see how it actually connects to class. So uh, I thought it would be probably best to start off with a definition, and this is my own personal one, but uh, I'd contend that any media, uh, could be literature, film, uh, what have you, uh, whose main purpose is to discuss potential technologies, societal problems, and or scientific discovery in a futuristic setting uh, can be classified as science fiction. Um, so with that definition, I would say that science fiction is very much a marriage between concrete scientific ideas and an imagination that takes them further. Uh, all right, so armed with that definition, we can say what science fiction is, but what do I mean when I say that it's actually useful and how does it connect to class? Uh, I think that's probably best answered by just giving you a bit of background about where I'm coming from. and. Uh, I can't pinpoint exactly when I started to first uh, like science fiction, but chances are it probably had to do with that movie. Uh, and I think that's probably the case for a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> but I think more than anything, I've always just been captivated by great stories. And uh, I, I really do believe that stories can be quite powerful no matter what the topic. Uh, but personally, I think sci science fiction stories are one of the best ways uh, to go about telling a story because you get uh, perspectives on technology, the future, science, and uh, I think those are all really important uh, discussions. And those kinds of discussions are probably familiar to everybody in class because uh, I think that's what we do every time we have a class. We dissect new technology, we hear expert opinions about what their impact could be, and I'd argue that this is exactly the same thing that's occurring in science fiction, and hence it's one of the reasons why I enrolled in the class in the first place. All right, great. So science fiction does some of the same uh, analysis that we do in class, but uh, you know, so what? Why does it matter? At the end of the day, the stories are highly speculative. They may or may not pan out. So why bother giving them any serious consideration? Uh, and here's where I want to emphasize their usefulness, because I would say that science fiction stories are much the same as uh, thought experiments carried out by uh, physicists and philosophers in that you take uh, some sort of initial premise, you flesh it out to the end uh, where you can find its logical conclusion, and then from that point you can actually look around and say, hey, uh, what are the effects of this, this premise? What does it all mean? Uh, so for example, uh, uh, Erwin Schrodinger's famous thought experiment uh, uh, looked at uh, ideas that were um, current at the time about quantum superposition. Uh, and he, he, he flushed those out to a logical conclusion, and he found that there was actually a flaw in the standard interpretation of quantum phenomena. Um, and that was, uh, he, he illustrated that by, by just saying that you can't have a cat that's both dead and alive at the same time. It, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and I would say that in a, in a similar vein, you can take some sort of concept, let's say, let's call it transhumanism. Uh, one could appreciate that it has the potential for dividing members of society. And I think that's a fair assumption. It's a logical progression of ideas. Um, and then you can take it to a conclusion. And maybe the conclusion is that, you know, in the future, uh, only certain members of society are going to have access to retractable machete elbows. Uh, like in the game Deus Ex Human Revolution, which is an amazing game and I, I highly recommend playing it. Um, but really what I just want to show here is that uh, science fiction is a tool, it's a thought experiment, uh, much the same as any of the other sorts of thought experiments that happen in other fields. All right, so I would say that because of this thought process, science fiction has uh, what I've identified as four uh, powerful features. The first being is that uh, they can stimulate inquiry about our world, uh, and they can change firmly held opinions. Uh, and that's evidenced by a ton of different movies like Space Odyssey, and I'll talk about a bit of those later on. Um, they're able to probe controversial ideas without ethical constraints. Oh. Uh, they drive scientific progression itself in some cases. 
and they can also confront current societal issues in a futuristic context. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'll go through each of these in detail. Uh, so first up, uh, how does science fiction promote inquiry? Um, I think one of, the, one of the things I've noticed about all great sci-fis is that they all have an amazing starting. And so I just edited together a little clip of some of my favorite movies. Uh, hopefully it works out. So this first one is from the movie Akira. Saw that about two years ago. And I had no idea what it was about going in. I just downloaded it. I thought it'd be cool. This is just the opening scene. So it's pretty jarring. Oh, and I, I definitely love the... Uh... So I, I knew right away that I was going to watch this movie after just seeing that clip. But uh, if there was any doubt, uh, that was all gone right when this thing pops up. There. I had to see the movie after I saw that. The bold face font. Okay, and then this is a classic uh, scene from Space Odyssey. I think everybody can recognize that song because of this movie. Describe in single words. And then Blade Runner. Only the good things that come into your mind. About your mother? Your mother? Yeah. Let me tell you about my mother. Right, so uh, in that, that first scene, um, the guy on the right was asking the one on the left about, uh, he, he was asking him some questions to see if he was an android or not. And he asked him a question about his mother, didn't really like that so much. Uh, but I think they're all really great uh, examples of how uh, a, a science fiction story can really get you right away and sort of make you think about what's happening in this strange world. And I'm, has anybody seen any of those movies? Just, yep, all right, awesome. Uh, so I think uh, one of the best examples of how science fiction can, science fiction can do that, promote inquiry, uh, comes from Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was later adapted into the movie Blade Runner. And uh, it's set in a futuristic world where uh, biology and computing has evolved to the point where uh, we can make androids, which are essentially synthetic humans. And it's only with the strictest neurophysiological testing that you, you can actually distinguish them from humans. Uh, so androids make for an ideal workforce because uh, we can just pump them down a, a conveyor belt, not give them any sort of uh, human rights, and uh, then we've got a slave, class, uh, a slave class, uh, a slave labor class. Uh, so the story uh, focuses on uh, one person in particular, and that's Rick Deckard. Uh, he's a bounty hunter, and his whole job is to capture these androids and uh, retire them. And I use the word retire because technically, since they aren't humans, uh, they're technically, you can't kill them. So we retire them. Uh, anyway, so the whole story focuses on Rick Deckard. And I just wanted to talk about one scene where he's stuck in an elevator with two other people. And one of them is a singer, and the other one is a bounty hunter like himself. Uh, but he can't actually tell which one is the human and which one's the android. Uh, and that's pretty interesting because his whole job relies on that, his whole livelihood requires him to tell them apart. Uh, and B is that if he kills the human by accident, he'll go to jail for murder, but if he kills the android, he's doing society a favor. Uh, so after he finds out which one is which, uh, that leads him to inwardly remark, uh, so much for the distinction between authentic living humans and humanoid constructs. In that elevator at the museum, I rode down with two creatures, one human, the other android, and my feelings were the reverse of those intended, of those I'm accustomed to feel and required to feel. Uh, and I think that's pretty powerful because uh, what it's really asking is, what is it that makes, what is it that makes us human? You know, is it our behavior? Is it our capacity for empathy? And why is it that androids are, are being viewed as inferior in this world if we can't even tell them apart from, from each other? Uh, so I think this is a great example of how science fiction can promote sort of general inquiry into very fundamental questions. Uh, and in this, in this book and in the movie, it's being used as a tool for self-reflection. All right, so uh, hopefully I've convinced you a little bit that science fiction is a great way to promote sort of that sort of inquiry. 
Um, but it's also really good because it can target controversial ideas, um, and that's seen in a few different movies like Gattaca and Ghost in the Shell, uh, but also the movie Splice. Uh, these days it's sort of tough to get any sort of uh, animal, uh, animal test past uh, an ethics committee. Uh, research labs tend to have to sort of keep their, their animal research out of the public spotlight. Um, mostly because the public probably wouldn't understand the purpose of, of the research and there could be some sort of uh, outcry. Uh, so I think science fiction is great because you don't actually need to have those sort of, uh, you don't need to get anything approved. You can just imagine what the future could be like uh, based on certain research advances and then you can sort of uh, investigate what those uh, advances could do to society. Uh, so that's exactly what happens in Splice and uh, I picked uh, Splice because I think it's relevant to current studies in genetics. Uh, so it's about a group of researchers who are taking uh, a variety of different animal species and they're splicing together the DNA from each of them to create uh, a unique animal hybrid. And uh, they're hoping that they're going to be able to harvest some sort of new biomolecules and that might have clinical applications and, uh, and that would make them very wealthy obviously. Uh, but eventually, one of the headstrong re researchers decides to splice in human DNA into one of the test subjects. And uh, eventually, you know, you're left with that creature thing on the left. Uh, so, so the researchers are sort of torn because they don't know whether to raise this, this new animal as a, as a growing child or, or whether to study it as a test subject. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, you, you probably guessed that, you know, the creation of such a creature uh, leads to their downfall. And uh, I don't particularly like that cliché take on genetic research, but uh, it undoubtedly raises questions that we're going to have to answer. Uh, like, do we have the ethical grounds to conduct this kind of research? Uh, and where do we draw the line for what kinds of knowledge we should and shouldn't have access to? Uh, so I think Splice really asks where we draw that line. Should there be any sort of uh, forbidden knowledge? Uh, it really does say, let's go past that boundary and let's see what happens. And you know whether the movie's uh, portrayal of that uh, is accurate or not is debatable. But I think the the real triumph is that they've actually probed it at all. And I think science fiction is uh, is a great way to do that. All right. So, uh, science fiction can uh, promote inquiry, probe controversial ideas, but one of its unique features uh, is that it can actually drive scientific progression. And uh, I've illustrated that just with like this, uh, this little flow chart here. But basically, uh, what you have is uh, a little schematic that shows that some sort of scientific discovery, could be any, in any sort of field, is eventually going to inspire authors to make new science fiction stories based on that discovery. Uh, and eventually they're going to implement that discovery in creative ways that sort of take it uh, past what was originally intended. And those sorts of, uh, those sorts of uh, I guess, creative ways of, of doing that can actually influence current researchers to say, hey, that's a great idea, I never thought of that, let's try and make it a reality. Uh, so I think one of the best examples of that is William Gibson's Neuromancer. Um, and it's particularly telling because uh, it predates the, the widespread use of the internet by uh, roughly a decade or, or maybe a bit more. It was, um, it was written in 1984 and uh, personally I, I can't remember using the internet uh, as an actual real helpful tool until around like 2000, but I'm, I mean, I'm not the oldest guy here, but uh, anyways. Uh, uh, I think um, this book is, uh, is it's pretty, it's pretty influential whenever you want to uh, discuss the internet because uh, the language used in it is woven directly into the language that we use to discuss the internet. So it coined terms like cyberspace and surfing the net and the matrix. And uh, even those terms are probably seem a little dated at, the, at this point. Um, you definitely know uh, what I'm talking about when I mention them. Uh, and so uh, I think but the, that the greatest feat of Neuromancer isn't really in the slang used to describe the net, but actually how, the concept of how the net functions. Because 
in, in, uh, in Neuromancer, uh, characters are able to physically interact with the net through uh, a virtual reality system, which is just the matrix. And uh, although we don't have it today, uh, what, it what it enables the users to do um, are some of the things that we can do today, uh, like connecting with other people instantly across the, across the globe, uh, hacking into other computer networks, and also having access to uh, a huge amount of information. So while those concepts probably in the mid-80s seemed really fantastic and crazy, um, I would say that they probably inspired uh, early web designers uh, to create the internet as we use it today. And, um, you know, you, everybody's probably done at least two of those things today. Uh, all right, so uh, now I sort of want to shift gears uh, and talk about how science fiction uh, can discuss the present. It, it might seem a little counterintuitive that uh, a genre which is so dedicated to the future uh, can actually be looking at the present, but uh, I would say that all great science fiction really just takes a, a contemporary issue and then places it in a futuristic context. Um, so for example, uh, what does racism mean if we can choose the color of our skin, eyes, and other morphological features? Uh, I think that will be a pertinent question in the future, probably not right now, but um, I, I just attached that a little cartoonified version of a gene, but we already do have the knowledge um, about what it is that makes uh, our hair colors dark and what it is that separates us from each other uh, visibly. Uh, and I think one of the best ways, uh, or one of the newest ways to, to look at the present is going to come from video games. I think that they're uh, a great way to tell a story. I think they're going to be the next big way that writers uh, really get involved with telling stories. Um, because uh, I've, I've noticed that we're seeing more and more games that sort of weave philosophy and science and society together um, for one sort of cinematic experience. Uh, and I think the best game, or at least the best, the best recent game for that, uh, I'd say, is the first Bioshock game. Um, it's set in this world uh, and it's, uh, that borrows from Ayn Rand's theories of objectivism and laissez-faire economics to construct this, this, this city called Rapture, um, which is based entirely on uh, unrestricted scientific pursuit, unrestricted uh, economic policy. Uh, so in essence, it's sort of like an idealized version of our current society, of North American society. Um, and so on the, uh, but oh, one thing I should mention, uh, it's a little removed figuratively, obviously, because we do have certain restrictions in place, but it's also removed literally from society because the city's at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and so on the way down, you're treated to an orientation film from this guy. Uh, his name's Andrew Ryan, Ayn Rand, Andrew Ryan. Um, and he basically says that his whole idea for the city was that, yes, there's going to be no intrusion from religion or the government. Everybody's going to be free to reap the benefits of uh, what they sow. And so that's a great idea, right? Uh, but the results aren't really that pretty. Uh, more, uh, Rapture is a, a morally bankrupt city. Uh, bloodthirsty scavengers everywhere, preying on the weak, and really the only way to survive is to lose all sense of human decency. Um, and part of the reason for Rapture's downfall was its unregulated scientific research, which, although empowering to its citizens, um, like this advertisement right here that you sort of see when you walk around the city, uh, this, is, this guy can uh, manipulate fire right at his fingertips, um, it eventually, that sort of stuff eventually led to misuse, and uh, the image on the right is generally how you use fire in the game. Uh, so I would argue that Bioshock is a great example of how developers have been able to use science fiction um, to carry out a thought experiment, and that they, they took our current system, took it to a logical conclusion, and then asked, uh, and then uh, I guess the end result was uh, an elegant and powerful critique that said, we can't handle complete freedom. We do need some restrictions in place. Uh, so hopefully, uh, this talk has shown you that science fiction is more than just imaginative thinking. Uh, they're very much thought experiments taken to that, I love that phrase, they're logical endpoints. Uh, they stimulate audiences, probe controversial ideas, inspire new research, and they're also able to critique our present day society. 
Um, and although it's difficult to predict what the future might be, uh, at least science fiction enables, uh, or it gives us a tool with which to do so and uh, really lets us envision what we want the future to be. So that concludes my little presentation. <laughs> Oh. So, uh, one thing I've always found striking about Jonathan Schaefer's uh, approach to this general area is he thinks that a lot of the fear of AI and the fear of science in general is all the fault of, of uh, science fiction. Um, <laughs> That's probably true. There's, there's a ton of movies that definitely are like that. <laughs> So, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about uh, regulations, particularly in areas where there are no uh, uh, regulatory bodies at the moment, like in uh, nanotech, we, we think there will be a day when there, th that needs to be regulated, but it's not regulated at, at all now. Does science fiction require, should there be any limits <laughs> at all on what, what you, should you I, be I able to write about absolutely anything? I think that's, that's what I was sort of arguing the case for. I think <laughs> that science, I think that we can't really do those sorts of, you know, certain experiments right now, but at right. least you can just write about them and picture what they might be like. Right. Uh, it's, it's obviously not a perfect sort of estimate of what things might be like, but I think right. if you think things through logically, if, if every sort of thought follows from the next one, and then you have some sort of end result, you probably would get, be able to say, hey, this, this might actually happen. Yeah. So is uh, the need for you know, catharsis a sufficient justification for the, the most scary movie you can possibly, or the scary uh, story you can possibly imagine? Is, is harm done when, when, when you do the perfect, the, the scariest story okay. ever? Uh, you know? Well, I can't really say for horror movies so much. <laughs> I'm not a horror movie fan. Um, but I yeah. think that, uh, you know, there's such thing as a necessary evil sometimes. And maybe, right. you know, there might be a, a, a topic that we, we don't really want to face the answer for. But I think uh, science fiction and other, you know, any other sorts of genres are really good. Right at uh, making us actually come face to face with that sort of thing. So, singularity seems to me to be a thought experiment. I would say so, yeah. Okay, so why didn't you relate that to what you were presenting in your Okay, uh, well I guess if, uh, if it's a thought experiment then it's going to have to take some sort of initial premise and that's that there's maybe where we're living in a place where there's like this sort of explosion of, uh, I don't know, explosion of uh, technological advances that there's sort of this exponential curve. Um, and I think that I remember when we, when we looked at Marcus Hutter's PowerPoint presentation, he, there were sort of three paths or something that he, that he outlined that that could take. Uh, so I guess either any of those three paths, one where um, there's like a massive explosion of intelligence and it, it happens so fast, it, we can't even realize it, we can't keep up, and sort of there's like a virtual reality and a, a present uh, reality and we don't actually see what's going on. That could be one sort of logical conclusion that you could reach. Then another one that he said was, uh, now I can't really remember exactly. Um, I can't, uh, does anybody remember what the, there was an explosion jump of intelligence and then computing speed maybe, which doesn't necessarily confer intelligence. But so anyways, I would argue that like if, yeah. if, if it had to be if it had to do with the singularity, if you take the the, the idea that there's going to be sort of an explosion of intelligence, you can take it to to uh, you know a, a bunch of different places, and one of them might be that you know robots become so intelligent that we can't even converse with them, and that it, it'll pass us by. Right. Actually, each of the various uh, scenarios would make a pretty good uh, science fiction story. One is where Basically, the internet wakes up. The internet becomes okay. Uh, yeah, that was. Oh, that happened. Yeah. Actually, that happened in Ghost in the Shell. That was one of yeah. the ideas. Yeah. 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 So I think each of those would would make good. Uh, I hope that didn't dodge your question too much. I try to think <laughs> on my feet. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, so other questions. 
So I'm kind of disappointed. You show the mask, but you never mention V for Vendetta. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I, yeah, I love that movie. Actually, it's one of my favorite movies. Um, so relating that to the singularity. V for Vendetta and the singularity? Specifically V for Vendetta? Specifically V for Vendetta. How could I? I have no idea how you could relate to this. Oh, I was just doing, oh, the reason why I had the mask was, uh, oh, I thought that it was going to, do you know the, the hacker group Anonymous? That's why I, I put that up there. The hackers, there's a group, uh, like they're called hacktivists. They, they have like a political agenda and they, they hack into government uh, databases around the world. And there's been a few of them that have been arrested. Um, so, but they all, their whole symbol is they use that Guy Fox mask. So that's what the, I didn't make that clear though, but yeah, that's, that's what I was going for, that hacktivist group anonymous. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions? Well, thank you Thanks, very yeah. much, and we'll now go on to Jason.